For me, the analogy is, who would I invite into my house and take them through my photo albums? And if I wouldn't let that person look at all those pictures, then I won't let them follow me on Instagram. And I think the way we treat, we treat Instagram is so warped because we treat it in such an intimate way. I think that the kind of content we put up there, pictures of ourselves, pictures of our families, pictures of our homes, for selfies, especially the kids, the, I mean the youngsters, especially teenage girls, like 30 selfies a day. <laughs> and it's bizarre. <laughs> and, um, and for me, that's intimate content. And why should some random person on the other side of the world be able to see all that content? So unless you're taking pictures of the trees and the grass and the sky and the birds, then I don't think you should have an open Instagram profile. And that's my very strong view. Um, I think we're pretty good at treating Twitter like a very, very public platform. But for some reason, there's this disconnect with Instagram that people are prepared to put this very private content out there, um, but, and, and, and then not have any privacy settings. The other issue is that if you do have an open privacy, uh, open uh, Instagram account, is that if you um, Google your name, every single picture that you Instagram will come up on a Google search. And particularly for those of you who are students and entering the job market, bear in mind that your potential employer will be and all those Instagram pictures will come up um, in the search tab of a Google search of yourself. The other issue is a smaller issue, and that's just copyright. And it's, I say it's a smaller issue because it's true for all the platforms. And that is that as soon as you apply any filter on Instagram to any of those pictures, uh, you grant Instagram a license to use the copyright in that photo, or the license to use that photo, which is basically the same as ownership right. They can do what they want with it, really. They can sell it on to advertisers if they want to. They don't have to ask you. They don't have to tell you. They certainly don't have to pay you. <coughs> now, we'll talk in a moment about the chain of publication, but just while we're talking about Instagram, I thought I'd show you this. This is a 19-year-old girl called Jennifer Pollack who lives in Canada, in Ontario. No, I, I lie, in Montreal. And she's walking past this piece of graffiti. She takes a picture of it and she Instagrams it. Now, there's no suggestion at all that she creates the graffiti herself. She merely is walking by, takes a picture of it, and Instagrams it. And she's arrested because the picture shows the Minister of Police in Canada with a bullet through his head, which was deemed a hate speech image. And the hashtag is Ian Lafrenier, which is his name, hashtag Montreal, hashtag police. Um, and so she was arrested, I think it was an absolutely rubbish prosecution because, yeah, uh, uh, I just think it was ridiculous. But a prosecution nonetheless. Um, so just bear in mind that you don't want to start publishing other people's illegal content. <coughs> Are any of you on Snapchat? Thank you. Have any of you, okay, a few people? Do any of you know about Snapchat? I mean, you, does anyone not know about Snapchat? <laughs> Sorry, I'm also actually going to out to me. Sorry? Yeah, so Snapchat, primary school kids, I find, on Snapchat nonstop. But high school students, I'd say of the schools that I've spoken to, I speak to a lot of schools, I speak to quite a few schools every week. Of the schools I've spoken to in the last three months, Snapchat is the most popular social network. More popular than Facebook, more popular than Twitter, more popular than Instagram. And the premise of Snapchat is this. I take a photograph, I can edit it, so I can give you a moustache, or I can draw a penis on your forehead, or I can write something. Um, then I give it a caption and I send it to you. And then you open up your Snapchat, and when you click on the image, it appears on your phone, and then it deletes between two and ten seconds after you've received it. The sender sets the time limit, and then you can't, and then it gets deleted. Well, at least that's how they sold it to us, but they lied. <laughs> because, and they really did lie. They, they stood before the Federal Trade Commission in the States six weeks ago, and the two founders stood up in front of the FTC, and they admitted to having lied. And they said that where they said that it was deleted, they meant it was deleted from their servers, not on the actual recipient's device. There are apps that you can download with very minimal technical know how actually you can download them yourselves, but there are even apps that you can download. There's one called Snap Hack, which allows you to uncover every single snap of sent. Even if it's set to two seconds, there's still time to take a screenshot. And so we see a lot of these pictures being screenshotted in the back of mind. And you can imagine the kind of content that people are sending to each other, thinking that it's going to be deleted, right? Particularly in the context of sexting. So it's become incredibly popular. There are 700 million snaps sent on Snapchat every single day. And um, it absolutely terrifies me, just because people do use it like it's, been, like it's deleted. I think children are starting to work out that it's not deleted, um, but often the hard way. <coughs> and it's not just children who get it wrong. There was an Australian politician recently who took a picture of his penis inside a glass of white wine, as one does, <laughs> and um, sent it to a woman who wasn't necessarily his wife. Um, 
and she took a screenshot of it and landed up online. And <laughs> he was he was forced to leave Parliament or whatever you call it in Australia. But it did lend itself to some pretty amazing headlines. I think my favourite was Plonker plonks his plonker in the plonk. <laughs> Which is amazing. Okay, so, so this is important because this is important because for those of you who are going to enter the job market, your LinkedIn profile really is your online CV. I know it's an irritating platform because of the sheer number of emails that they send you. But have a, have a rule, put it in a folder. But um, you do need to have an Instagram, I mean, a LinkedIn profile. Because it is so high ranking in Google search results, it will be the first, second, or third result of your name. And we'll talk more about your potential employer Google here. But it does need to be there, it does need to be up to date. I've got friends in the board who send me endless requests, particularly in London and New York, saying, please endorse my Instagram profile. Because they won't even offer you a, a job unless you have a highly endorsed LinkedIn profile. I think that's crazy because you know it's just such a uh, an inaccurate reflection. But um, have your CV there. Make sure it's up to date. Make sure there's nothing compromising. Make sure there's a good photograph. And um, we started to see a bit of litigation around LinkedIn, particularly in the context of sort of restraints of trade when people leave companies. Because in the old days, it was quite clear that you left a little black book with all your company's contacts on your desk and your Rolodex with all the business stuff at the class at, at your company when you left. But now there's been this blurring of the personal and professional. So we have seen more and more of this kind of you know, litigation popping up on our courts, but still not quite as much as the other platforms. So, I mean, you know, when, when I go to dinner parties and I tell people that I'm a social media lawyer, they kind of say to me, well, what does that mean? What are, how are, what are the social media laws like in South Africa? Are they strict? And I have to say that there are no special social media laws because content online is treated in exactly the same way as content on any other public platform. There is absolutely no difference legally in the way that the law treats an article on the front page of the newspaper, an insert on card launch, or a Facebook page. Because as soon as it's been published, one other person has been published for the purposes of our law. So there are no special laws. Um, so the same laws apply, the same ethical considerations apply. So I speak in particular if you are in any kind of, I don't know, if you're a sport, professional sportsman, for example, if there is any code which um, dictates how you behave, that would apply to your conduct on the as well. Um, perhaps even more so than it does on the sports field because it is so much more permanent um, and so much more public. <laughs> also your contractual obligations. So if you're a student at the university, you have a contract with the university in terms of which you have to behave in a certain way. And if you are employed by the university, you also have a contract. So no special rules. Those are some of them. Defamation is really, you know, just when you hurt the reputation of another person. It's not to say you can never defame anyone. It's just as pretty easy to defame somebody. So you must make sure if you are going to defame somebody that you have a defense. Um, the defenses to defamation are usually truth and public interest. So I could say you know, MTN is the worst service provider I've ever had in the fortune of dealing with. I could say that on my Twitter because I've just spent two hours at the MTN shop and they're still getting my billing on and they still haven't given me the data that I've paid for and I had to queue for two hours and nobody helped me and I'm furious because it's not just true and good it's an opinion, it's your honest opinion. If I see this and I retweet somebody else's tweet this, but I've had no first-hand knowledge. Then I've started to enter into quite dangerous territory because I don't necessarily know what my defense is. Even worse is if I'm actually from Celsius or Mocom and I just tweet this thing and I completely make it up. Then there's no grounds to defend the defamation. But certainly, you can defend people. The law allows you to be very extreme in your defamation. But be careful because if I tweet this about defamation and in five years' time, I don't know about defamation, sorry. If I tweet this about MTN, and that's fine, it goes under the radar. But in five years' time, I actually won't get a job of MTN. <laughs> <laughs> you would think that like, would never come up. But in five years' time, if you type Emma Sadler, MTN, into a search engine, <coughs> the first result will be this tweet from five years ago. That's terrifying. You never know where you're going to want to land up working. Um, I was I got a call from a recruiter the other day. Really, really high profile job which came available, the mining company for in house law. And I recommended to this recruiter that they uh, hire a girl that I, that I, that I know of. I mean, she's absolutely brilliant, incredibly intelligent, super, super lawyer. 
So she said she, uh, the recruiter, Googled her name, and the first thing that came up was this, she went on a rant about tashes and Morizage, and how long you have to wait for the, for the thing, and swearing and stuff, and she said, not interested. Just one little tweet about how much she hated some kind of particular service, and it was completely true. But yes, it was an assumed thing, it meant that this was going kind to of get possibly one of the best legal jobs that have popped up for a long time. So be careful about the way you defend people, <coughs> and what your intention is in, in defending people because sometimes it's not such a good idea. Privacy in South Africa is, the test for privacy is, do I have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a particular set of circumstances? Which sounds pretty fancy, but it basically means, do I have a right to privacy in that particular moment? So standing here, I feel like I've got the paparazzi here. I've had endless photographs taken of me, now I'm being filmed. Um, do I have a right to privacy? Is my privacy being infringed by this you know, documentation of this talk? No. I'm in a public place. I'm here to talk to you. Presumably it's going to be used for the university's purposes. If I was standing naked in my bathroom of my house and he came with his camera and started taking all these photographs of me, would my right to privacy be infringed then? Yes, absolutely. So it's always a subjective test. And so, <coughs> in my view, the more you look after your privacy, the bigger the right becomes. If I have an open Instagram profile and I'm taking 20 pictures a day of me half naked in a bikini or in my underwear and then suddenly in the Sunday Times publishes a picture of me in my bikini, could I be upset about it? If I had never ever taken a photograph and Instagrammed it, my right to privacy is much higher than my view. So, so always think to yourself, the more you share, the less that right to privacy becomes. It's a controversial assessment because of course the law is also new that we're also trying to work it out at the same time. But that's my very strong view. Um, hate speech is any kind of discriminatory speech, whether it's racist speech, homophobic speech, uh, speech which is religiously intolerant, intolerant, um, intolerant of other people's political views, sexist speech, all of that falls into the category of hate speech. If you do commit some kind of hate speech on social media, you can lay a complaint at the Human Rights Commission, as I said, they are the arbiter of it. Criminal neuria is a sort of criminal kind of defamation. So if somebody infringes your dignity in a very serious way, so for example, somebody calls you the K-word, and you know exactly who that person is and it's directed at you, you can go and lay a complaint at the police station and the standard jail time for that is three months. So <coughs> it's um, very useful because it becomes a criminal matter. So you can go and lay a complaint at the police station and, and then the police have to investigate and use their resources. Whereas if I sue you with information, it's going to cost me quite a lot of money. Um, in my view, it's underused on social media in South Africa. Confidentiality is absolutely critical, particularly as we start entering the workforce. Um, you know, I've had teachers who have taken pictures um, and put on Facebook, thank goodness my test has been set, and there's a picture of half the test on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I, you laugh, it's happened. Um, I was called into a law firm recently where a candidate attorney, a training lawyer, had taken a photograph of her desk and put it onto Facebook with the captions, look how much work I have to do, fuck my life, FML. And to be fair, there was a lot of pieces of paper on all those desks. Because that's kind of what lawyers do, right? You just read papers and it's totally boring. Um, except on the top of one of the piles of paper were the names of two listed entities who had entered into a very, very confidential transaction. Yeah, exactly. It's terrifying. There's problems with the law society, employment contract, I mean, she definitely could be fired uh, inside of trading offences. There was no malice at all. There was no intention to distribute this information. She took a picture of her lunch, she put that online. So now she took a picture of her desk, and put that online. It's this default to over documentation, which really does cause quite a lot of harm. <coughs> so you can imagine what happened there. Um, state secrets will become a bigger issue um, if the Secrecy Act is eventually implemented. Intellectual property, just because something is online, don't think that there is no IP attached to it. Uh, copyright, of course, trademark. If you have a blog and you want to use other people's photographs in your blogs, make sure that you're allowed to. Make sure that you're not just copy pasting. Make sure that you've got it from a Creative Commons website or that you've subscribed to an images website. <coughs> or that at the very least you state where you got it from and the, and, and the author. <coughs> the Protection from Harassment Act is crucial because it's kind of the cyber bullying law. I'm sorry about all this boring legal stuff. I'll get back to some more fun stuff in a moment. Um, but they're basically, they're calling it the cyber bullying law. What it allows, it basically just extended the ambit of the Domestic Violence Act. Remember in the old days, you had an ex-husband who was beating you up, you could get a restraining order, a protection order against that person. But the problem there was that the 
um, the person you're getting the restraining order against, the protection order against, you have to have been in a domestic relationship with that person. So you have to have lived with them or worked with them or been married to them or been in a relationship with them. Now, you can get a protection order against anybody who's harassing you. Um, and you don't even need to know who that person is. Never mind to not have been in a domestic relationship with them. You can get it against an anonymous person. It's very quick, it's very easy. I've had incredible success with it. And even children are allowed to get these protection orders against people um, without any kind of parental assistance or consent, which is why they're calling it the silent bullying law. But it's absolutely amazing. So if somebody starts a Facebook account in your name, or starts a Twitter account and then start tweeting porn pictures, or if you're getting incessant SMSs or Facebook messages or calls in the middle of the night, you can use this act quite effectively. And then your code of conduct at school, <coughs> not at school, at university, your code of conduct of employment or your code of conduct as a student of the university. <coughs> so I spoke briefly a moment ago about the chain of publication, and it's the last of the boring legal slides, I promise. Um, and what this means, it's quite an important principle to understand, is that every single person responsible for publishing content can get into trouble if that content is illegal. So it doesn't matter how close you are to it or how far you are to it. So say I'm driving here this afternoon and I stop at the traffic lights and I buy a newspaper. And there's an article on the front page of the newspaper that says Emma Sadler is the worst lawyer in the history of the universe. She bought her degree, she's a fraud. Basically, if you consult her, you're taking your life into your own hands. She's just made it all up. I'm really upset about it and I want to sue for defamation because, you know, for lawyers, that's what we do. Who can I sue? <laughs> who can I sue? I can sue the journalist who wrote the article. I can sue the editor who looked at the article and decided to publish it on the front page. The publisher, the co so the company who owns the newspaper, the people who actually printed it, the man who drove the van, who dropped it off on the side of the street, <laughs> and even the newspaper man who sold me my newspaper. They were all in the chain of publication. If it wasn't for each of those people, I would never have received it. If I bought it at the CNA, the CNA is responsible for that content. I can sue the CNA. But the CNA has a defense, which we call innocent dissemination. Basically, yeah, they're responsible for every single word of every book, magazine, newspaper that they sell. But they have this defense of innocent dissemination until they're aware of it. When I send a letter to the CNA and say, look, on page four of that book you're selling with this title, there's child pornography, there's defamation, there's an infringement of privacy, there's an intellectual property infringement, whatever it might be, stop selling it or we'll sue you. They use the defense of innocent dissemination. It sounds like a tricky principle to understand, it's super easy. And exactly the same rules apply online. Somebody goes on to Hello Peter and they say that the University of Johannesburg is the worst institution in the world and it's riddled with corruption and professors are useless. You're upset about it. Who can you sue? You can sue or hold, hold accountable the person who actually wrote the complaint, the administrator of the website, Peter Shields, uh, the internet service provider. All of those people are in the chain of publication and can be sued. But of course, again, innocent dissemination. So this is quite an interesting case. Actually, I'll show you. I'll just quickly tell you about the retweeting and stuff. Um, if you retweet something, you're responsible for publishing it. Some people retweet things for different reasons, and sometimes you might have a defense, particularly sort of neutral reporters, this is the way the journalists would quote a tweet in an article. The same sort of things apply. But if you are retweeting some kind of super confidential information, then the likelihood of you getting into trouble because of that is quite high. Um, there was a footballer, I say was because he's now in jail, a footballer in Wales <laughs> called Ched Evans. Now Ched Evans was convicted <coughs> and sentenced to five years in prison for raping a girl. But it was a kind of a date rape. He went <coughs> on a date with the girl, you know, had a few drinks, come back to his house, and he raped her. And some of his fans, some of his friends even, thought it was outrageous that he'd been sentenced to prison because it was this date rape scenario. The allegation was, I hate this expression, that she cried rape afterwards. And somebody tweeted her name. Every single person who retweeted her name was arrested. Some of them got to court and said, we didn't mean to, we did it innocently, we were drunk when it happened, didn't matter. They were all arrested, and some of them sentenced to pretty, se pretty serious fines and suspended sentences. <coughs> so be careful before you retweet something. Unless you're prepared to step into the shoes of the person who tweeted something, then, then don't retweet it. Lord McAlpine showed us that there was no safety in numbers because he managed to sue thousands and thousands of people who retweeted his name in connection with paedophilia allegations. Um, liking something, there was just a case, a federal case in the States that said liking something on Facebook is a form of protected expression. The judge said it's, that, it's like having a political banner down the side of your house. The idea that you can get into trouble for liking something is amazing. 
But actually, having said that, some of these really objectionable examples I've shown you so far, it's not been working for me. I'd like to. For example, I propose correctional rape for any white person who twerks, or you know, <laughs> rape could be quite fun. I would want to know why they like that, because you are aligning yourself with a particular view. And so it can compromise you as well. Um, if you share something on Facebook, you're definitely publishing it. No defense of of dissemination, because you've actually looked at it and actively decided to publish it further. And then we had a very interesting case in Pretoria High Court last year. It's called Esparta versus Richter. And it's a published case, or a reported case, but basically what happened there was that there was a couple who were divorced. The ex-husband had remarried a much younger woman. And the new wife had gone onto Facebook and written something horribly defamatory about the ex-wife. Something about how dare she let the teenage son laugh the baby child. Again, allegations of pedophilia. I'm afraid it often is allegations of pedophilia because it's the one time that people rush off to court to try and protect their reputations because it is the worst thing you can say about somebody. <coughs> It's something that you never really come, recover from. Anyway, so this new wife had written these two posts, didn't directly refer to the ex-wife, but anybody reading it would know that that's who she was talking about. So indirect reference is sufficient for a lot of these laws, certainly for defamation. And um, she tagged her husband in the status. Her husband didn't do anything. He didn't like it, he didn't comment on it, he didn't share it, he did nothing. When the ex-wife sued for defamation, she sued the new wife and the ex-husband jointly. And the judge found them equally liable because the judge said that he could have taken steps to dissociate himself from that content. By not doing so, he was allowing himself to be aligned with a particular point of view, which sounds extreme, but it's this whole sort of chain of publication thing on steroids. So bear in mind, if somebody tags you on a status, you don't want to be tagged in. Okay, so the simple, the simple answer. Sorry, yeah. Uh, is that also similar to the Chinese refer to like tag yourself in a photo? Are you liable for that tag? Or well, if you tag yourself in a photo and the photo is a child sexual abuse image, I wouldn't want to be aligned with that in any way. Um, but if somebody else tags you and the second it comes to your attention, you take steps to untag yourself, to dissociate yourself from the content, then I would be fine. But I mean, on that, you know, I spoke briefly about how this is all an exercise in personal reputation management. Google yourselves up and see what comes up. Take steps if you can to try and flush out some of the unsavory results. Um, have all your privacy settings on Facebook. Nobody can write on my wall unless I approve it. Nobody can tag me on a Facebook picture unless I approve it. Um, and it's very easy to do, and it's, it's pretty, it's then something you get notified as soon as somebody puts a picture of. But having said that, as soon as you take steps once the illegal content comes to your attention, to dissociate yourself, then you should be fine. And if you do get it wrong, do this and apologize. Yeah? What's the time frame of taking steps to dissociate yourself? Reasonable time. So if you can show that you've been out of the country and you didn't have signal, and you didn't, you only came to your attention two weeks later, absolutely fine. But if you're actively online and you're not dissociating yourself, then be careful. In the Esparta versus Richter case, though, they had received letters of demand, so he knew and he could have taken steps, even at that stage. He could have said, oh, I didn't see it. Um, but, you know, it, it is an interesting question, because now we just had, uh, there was a case, I suppose it's almost a year and a half ago now, which said that you can serve documents, um, serve legal documents via Facebook, because they were able to show, so you know how you normally get the sheriff to come and deliver the things, or you know, your clerk, or your, your um, drivers to go and deliver all these sort of legal documents. There was a special application made in the Mattel the Court. <coughs> where they could show that he was active on Facebook. They didn't know where he lived. They didn't know where he worked. They could see that he was uploading his Facebook status and stuff. And so they allowed service by Facebook. <laughs> uh, and that is something actually which has been done in all jurisdictions around the world. So you just have a special application that's now happening fairly routinely. Um, <coughs> because it is easy to see if somebody's active on Facebook. Okay, so let's quickly talk about this. I won't talk about the detail of the facts too much, but basically, there's a property down the road, it's actually next to the court, in the Joburg CBD, it's owned by the Dutch Reform Church. And the Dutch Reform Church owns this premises for years, and fairly predictably, the congregation of the Dutch Reform Church dwindles to the point that there's no reason for it to have a service in the middle of town, right? It's not exactly where, where their congregants live. And so they rent it out for a long time to Glory Divine World Ministries, which is a Christian congregation. They decide then that they should sell the church, and sell them to the premises. They offer it first to Glory Divine, they make an offer, it's a pathetic offer, it's refused, and they sell it instead to an Islamic academy. This infuriates Glory Divine, like you can't believe. 
So they start a Facebook activism page where they encourage members of the public, members of their congregation, to go online and write terrible things about the Dutch Reformed Church. <laughs> so the Dutch Reformed Church rushes off to court to get an internet, basically to get this page taken down. And various things happen, and I won't get into the intricacies of the case, but what the judge said was very important. She basically said that the creator of a Facebook page, the administrator of a Facebook page, regardless of whether it's a personal page or a company page or a university page, the administrator or the creator is responsible for every single word that appears on that page, regardless of who put it there. It's the whole chain of publication that was there, right? So the analogy she used is like having a big green felt notice board and encouraging the members of the public to come and stick their scrappy pieces of paper on that board. By virtue of you having the ability to take down any of the comments that you don't agree with, agree with, or whatever, you are responsible for everything that remains. Now, of course, you know, you have your own innocent disseminator until it comes to your attention. But if someone is using your page for hate speech or for any, any other legal purpose, you are responsible. So, the best way of doing that, if you do run any kind of big prolific page, <coughs> is to make sure that there are community standards on your page so people can notify you as soon as they see, make everybody else look for the legal content. As soon as they see something, get them to notify you and they take it down. It's very unusual that it wouldn't be worth your while to take it down. So those are just a couple of the high court cases. There, there have been quite a few now, and they all say very much the same thing. <coughs> Let me teach you a few rules. Uh, this is particularly aimed at the students, but actually at everyone. So the first rule is to regret nothing. Now this is a Dilbert cartoon of a man who's going in for an interview. And he goes into the interview and he hands over his CV, and the guy's interviewing him says, oh no, I don't need to see your resume. That's the old way of hiring. Now we use data from the internet to see what you've been up to lately. As a look, ew. And the guy says, I'll show myself out. You'll understand if I don't shake your hand. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new media. But I'm afraid it's exactly true. Because the first thing that I do, certainly, when I get a CV from a potential employee, is to Google them. I might check out their name. I might quickly look to see what kind of marks they're getting. And then I'll Google them. And if there's anything that I don't like that comes up, whether it's the way you spell on Twitter, or the grammar that you use on your blog, or the pictures of you drunk in the gutter party <coughs> on Facebook, um, then I'm not even going to give you an interview. And it doesn't have to be because remember in the old days, in the old days, in the current days, you've got to be very careful in an employment, in a sort of a prospective employment scenario. You know, if somebody comes for an interview, there's some personal information that I can't ask them. You know, I can't say, are you pregnant? Are you planning to have a baby next year? What religion are you? Because you can't discriminate on any of these, these primitive grounds. But remember that <laughs> companies are looking at your profiles. So they will see who you voted for in the last election, if you're particularly vocal about it. And they will see that you have put pictures of your uterus on Facebook because you are pregnant, um, which is my <laughs> pet hate in the world, um, when people think that that's OK, because I don't think it is. Um, but, but just bear in mind the kinds of personal information. And it is, it is illegal for them to use that information to decide not to hire you. But who's going to, do, who's going to work that out, right? Who's going to know that that's the reason? So be careful. If there is anything like that, you know, this is the online CV. Be careful. And so when I say, <laughs> be careful, perhaps I should just say that, you know what I said about the MTN tweet, that in five years' time, if you Google, me, if you Google my name, MTN will pop up. The content doesn't go anywhere. It's just about impossible to get anything to use from the internet. And I really wish that that wasn't the case. Um, we spent an awful lot of our time um, trying to get content, particularly in the context of sort of revenge porn, deleted from the internet. It's just about impossible. And information, actually. When you Google a company and the first five things that come up are how much uh, useless the company is. Um, you know, it's, it is difficult to get content deleted. <coughs> so what I say is to always treat every single thing that you put on the internet like a tattoo. And if you ever get a tattoo, I advise you to go to a tattoo artist who can spell. <laughs> because that's something that's going to stay with you for a very long time. And in much the same way. <laughs> and if you think that I'm lying, this is a girl called Paris Brown, who, um, apart from having rather interesting eyebrows, um, had, some <laughs> had some pretty interesting views on Twitter when she was 14 years old. 14 and 16, actually. So when she entered the job market, she was given this very high profile position. She was the first UK youth crime commissioner. She was really to be the mouthpiece between the police and the young people in England. And it was high profile. She was going to be on the radio, on the telly, and there she was looking very happy about life with her odd eyebrows. And, um, 
this is her not looking so happy, because the Daily Mail did a bit of digging about her, and found that she had posted these tweets when she was 14 years old. Some of them homophobic, some of them were racist, particularly against Pakistani people. Uh, some of them were about drugs and drinking and sex and violence. I don't think she was actually doing this stuff. I think it was just a case of a teenager trying to be cool. But just remember that, and I really feel sorry for children these days, the idea that what you post when you're 14 can actually compromise you down the line. Anyway, she was asked to leave the job. Um, <coughs> presumably, she's done a pretty serious social media cleanup in as far as possible. As I say, sometimes it's very difficult. And then, just quickly on the sort of online um, safety, uh, particularly to do with your online identity and online identity theft. <coughs> Remember how easy it is to pretend to be somebody else. Now I say to these kids, the kids that I speak to, you know about this guy. Um, the thing is that this guy's on Facebook now too. And it's much easier for him to be, pretend to be a good guy when he's on Facebook. This has happened at Southdowns College, which is a school in um, Centurion. Basically the headmaster went onto, this, onto Facebook, created a whole fake profile took photos from a family friend who lives in France of their daughter. Said he was 16 years old, said he went to the next door school, sent friend requests to all the kids at his school. And the results were absolutely amazing because where there was some hesitancy initially, as soon as they saw mutual friends, that was the key. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, this person is 16, she goes to the next door school, we've got 100 mutual friends, I must know her. It was that kind of mentality. And I think we're all kind of guilty of that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Unless you know exactly who somebody is, don't accept them because it's very easy to pretend to be somebody um, on social media. Uh, much, much easier than it ever has been historically. Limit the amount of personal information you share about yourself. This, you don't have to tell me about yourself. I already Facebook stalked you. <laughs> we said it became social media lawyers because we like Facebook stalking people, so it's even better if we get paid for it. But I do, I do think I'm a particularly proficient Facebook stalker. Now, if you give me an internet connection with somebody's name, so say you're going on a date with somebody on Friday night, um, mm -hmm. and three minutes, I can build a pretty extensive profile about them. Who they are, what they look like, how old they are, what they're interested in, what food they like to eat, where they go on holiday, who their friends are. It really is amazing. Now, why I bring this slide up is to remind you to be very careful about the personal information you're sharing. People who check in at home, and then two days later say, we're going to Cape Town for the weekend. Well, that's pretty useful information if you're a criminal. You know exactly where somebody lives and you know they're away from you. And you giggle that this stuff happens all the time. Remember, don't take any kind of false, um, what's this word that I'm looking for? Security. Uh, that's not even right, but it's basically okay. Um, from these privacy settings, because, you know, just always think to yourself what happens if this information ends up in the wrong hands. I have to phone a friend a, a week at least. People who, on the voting day, well, actually, no, it's, my friends who get married, because I'm of the marrying age, and they get their new ID book with their new surname on it, and they take a photograph of it, and they put it on Instagram. And they say, woohoo, look, I'm a whole new person. And, um, and, and there's the full name, and the ID number, and the date of birth, and that's useful for, a, for an online identity. There. Some people who take pictures of their, the people who check into their new houses, basically I don't think you should have location services enabled on your phone at all, ever, um, except for Google, for Google Maps and for find my iPhone. Otherwise, I don't think anybody wants to know where you are at any time. Okay, so the first rule was regret nothing. The second rule is never think you're anonymous online. And this happened fairly recently to a girl called Sarah. She sends a tweet to American Air. She says, at American Air, hello, my name's Ibrahim, and I'm from Afghanistan. I'm part of Al-Qaeda, and on June 1st, I'm going to do something really big. Bye. So American Air, <laughs> <laughs> and I replied saying, Sarah, we take these threats very seriously. Your IP address and details will be forwarded to security and the FBI. This is her response. Oh my fucking god, I was kidding. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm scared now. I was joking and it was my friend, not me. Take her IP address. <laughs> so, hey, please don't. I'm just a girl, please. <laughs> well, she's not lying there. She wasn't from Afghanistan. She was from the Netherlands. She was 14 years old and she was arrested. And. I think that probably the most important thing we talk about on this slide is this. I was joking and it was my friend to not me take her IP address at the time. Because I'm afraid I've noticed a bit of a trend. And that is that as soon as anybody gets into trouble, in any way. Oh, I left my Facebook open and I went to the toilet and I came back and somebody had framed me. Or I was, um, you know, my friend had my phone and she was actually the one who was commenting on Instagram. Or I'm afraid the excuse is getting tired because it is the default excuse. If you are the victim of somebody logging into your account and saying something offensive, illegal, 
text it, screenshot stuff. Remember, screenshots are always very powerful in evidence. Screenshot it, delete it, apologize to anybody who may have been offended. Um, because if it does come to the point that you get into some kind of trouble, either with the law or with the university, you need to be able to show that it wasn't you. And the only way you can show it wasn't you is if you took steps immediately upon finding about it. So be careful. <coughs> anyway, never think you're anonymous online. There are always ways to find out um, who somebody is. You know, the technical ways, this is the IP address. There are legal ways you can get a court order against these companies to hand over identifying information. And there are pretty practical ways as well, as was <coughs> shown by this. Rule number three, if you wouldn't say it to somebody's face, don't say it online. And this is one of my favorite examples ever. There's a boxer called Curtis Woodhouse. Now you know the thing about boxers is that they punch people in the head for a living. <laughs> So, Curtis Woodhouse has some fox, boxing fight or match or bout or whatever you call a boxing encounter, and he loses. And he comes home, and he opens up Twitter, and there's about 40 messages from a guy who calls himself Jimmy OV88, <laughs> aka the master. That's what we know about him. And some of them are pretty hectic. I mean, this is the most palatable of them. Retire immediately, kind of defend a pathetic title, you're a complete disgrace. Uh, there was some that said, you know, fight a 10 year old next time if you want to actually win. And then he starts using the hashtag, hashtag waste of spunk, um, for about 10 more of these tweets. Pretty offensive stuff. <coughs> Curtis Woodhouse, who, may I remind you, punches people in the head for a living, sees this content. None of the mood to play replies, saying, I'll give a thousand pounds to anybody that provides me with the address and picture of this man. Knock, knock. And lo and behold, in about a minute. James O'Brien, Nancy Rose, <laughs> you silly, silly boy. See you really soon, big boy. Just on my way to Sheffield to have a little chat with an old friend. Get the kettle on, Jimmy. Hashtag boxing, hashtag, or hashtag silly, silly boy. And then Curtis Woodhouse, who punches people in the head for a living, goes to have a little chat with his old friend, Jimmy, who is actually James O'Brien from Nancy Road. And then he tweets a bit more to make sure people realize that he's not actually joking. But I think it is a lovely illustration of how people are prepared to say things in the online world that they wouldn't say in the real world. And it should be fairly obvious, you know, if you are prepared to say to somebody's face, then don't say it online. Um, but I'm afraid some of these things we've lost. And I still see it now with my friends on Facebook who put a status up that I know they wouldn't say if it was just the two of us in a room together. And what is it? I'd love to do some kind of psychological analysis of what happens to you when you go online because you suddenly think that you're not a member of the real world. And there's this complete disconnect between who you are online and who you are in the real world. And that's one of the biggest dangers I think that we need to cure. And I think we need to cure it early, <coughs> particularly with younger people. The idea that you can be somebody else online. There should be absolutely no distinction between the same <coughs> and the real world you. Okay, then my last rule. <coughs> rule number four. If you wouldn't want your mother to see it, don't put it online. Now, this seems a pretty obvious um, rule, but you would be amazed how many people breach it. This was amazing. Oliver Rawlings sent a tweet to Mary Beard, who's a feminist at the forefront of this particular campaign, to have female representation on the English banknote. Retweet this, you filthy old slut. I bet your vagina is disgusting. What do you think, Jeremy Vine? Arrest me. Hashtag Rolo, which I have no idea what hashtag Rolo means. Google couldn't help. Um, <laughs> So somebody sees this and replies, saying, Mary, if you'd like to send a copy of Rawlings's tweet to his mother, Joanne, I'd be happy to give you the post. <laughs> <laughs> now, I love this for so many reasons, but particularly the idea that we should post a tweet <laughs> to somebody. Um, but clearly, Joanne is not on Twitter. Anyway, so this is the reaction, within a minute. I sincerely apologize for my trolling and wronging you. Hope this can be forgotten and forgiven. X, X, X. <laughs> I particularly love the X, X, X. <laughs> but actually, when I say, if you want your mother to see it, don't put it online, I should actually say, if you want the four P's to see it, don't put it online. <coughs> now, the four P's are quite simply your parents and anyone else who's important to you. You know, whether it's a grandparent or a cousin or a child or a niece or a nephew. If you wouldn't want your parents to see it, don't put it online. You wouldn't want the police to see it. Don't put it online. I.e., if you're doing something illegal, don't take it to the office and put it on Facebook. <laughs> Next is the potential employer. You wouldn't want a potential employer to see it put it online. And bottom right is a predator. And predator also, I suppose, includes an online identity thief. <coughs> I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb, those four. Um, for the children, I would include the P of principal. Um, I suppose here yeah, you're professor. Um, okay, so. <coughs> Let's quickly talk about employment law. It's the last thing that I'm going to talk about in any kind of detail before we move on to a few questions. 
that these headlines are becoming more and more frequent. And a lot of people think that it's desperately unfair that you can lose your job because of something that you've said uh, to your Facebook friends, for example. The law is absolutely clear that where you breach the duty of good faith, that you owe your employer, you can be fired. And where you bring the company you work for into disrepute, you can be fired. Now, I know I'm talking to a mixed audience, so actually the same rules apply. Uh, whether you work for the university or if you're a student here, if you bring the university into disrepute because of your conduct online as a student, you could be asked to leave uh, or disciplined up to expulsion. <coughs> and if you um, breach the duty of good faith that you owe the university, exactly the same rules apply. So I do appreciate that it's all got a bit trickier. You know, because now, in the old days it was very easy. When I was Joe Bloggs out having a beer on Saturday night, and when I was Joe Bloggs working at X company. And when I was working at X company, I knew I had to behave in a certain way. But when I was Joe Bloggs out drinking tequila on Saturday night, those rules didn't necessarily apply to me. Except maybe if I was Darren Scott. Remember when he got fired from the Super Sport? But he was at a party on Saturday night and he called somebody the K-word. And he was fired. The reason he was fired was because he was a celebrity. Because people could associate him with Supersport. People knew that he worked there, right? But remember what I said about us all being celebrities in the digital age? I can always work out. Every single person in this room has some kind of online presence. And you just give me your name and I can either work out what university you go to, who employs you. Um, and so these lines are becoming <coughs> more blurred, which is really unfortunate. Particularly, I feel like, you know, when I'm speaking to the kids, I say to them, you know you have to behave in a certain way when you're at school. And you know you have to behave in a certain way when you're at the shops in your school uniform. It's because you can be recognized as a student of the school. But now, because of your networks, because you say exactly on Facebook where you go to university, where you go to school, who employs you, those lines have become a whole lot more blurred. So you often see this, I tweet in my personal capacity, views on my own, views don't reflect the company views. They don't mean anything. <coughs> at all. They are not disclaimers. You can include them, certainly, um, but think of it more as an editorial comment. Because for as long as you can be associated with the company that you work for, then I don't believe that there's such a thing as personal capacity. You know, it's this, I work at Standard Bank, but I tweet in my personal capacity. Well, if you do something that brings you into disrepute to the point that it actually impacts the, your employment relationship, then you know, it doesn't matter what you're saying, you've got some really magic one that fixes it. Let me take you through a few of these quick examples. Uh, this is the Citizen newspaper which published on the front page of the newspaper uh, this image. It's a photoshopped version of this image which shows dead bodies. Um, it's a photograph which was taken in the aftermath of, the Afgan of an Afghanistan bomb blast. You remember when those five South African pilots were killed? It was in September 2012. The newspaper decided to run this edited version which was a very controversial decision. They thought it was unethical, a lot of people, and it was a huge topic of conversation on social media. Now, <coughs> Johan Hatting, who was employed by the citizen at the time, tweeted hashtag citizen clone, which is the hashtag everyone's using to talk about this issue. Cloning dead out of pick, unethical, unethical, unethical. Pictures editor complained, senior editorial staff was okay with it, what the fuck. He was fired immediately. Not because there is anything illegal about this tweet. It's completely defensible. Yes, it's defamatory, but he has a defense. The defense is, this is my honest opinion. Not motivated by malice. It's completely legal, but he's breaching the duty of good faith of the company because he's airing the dirty laundry of the company on this very public platform. So actually, Twitter, I mean, Citizen, the Citizen newspaper took such heat because of this decision. Particularly, the journalists were very upset about what happened. I mean, journalists and other organizations they released a statement saying, bringing the company name into disrepute by making the factory comments on Twitter, irretrievably damaging the trust relationship between employer and employee. Sounds a bit like a marriage. Um, if you are an employer-employee relationship, not just Facebook but blogging, you have to remember to always act in the employee's, employer's best interests. That is a common law compulsion. Um, Macintosh Pileda, remember this. Job took to first night in prison. Bell had been denied after being found guilty of murder, attempted murder, and racing while high. And in the tweet that got fired, I trust that Jim Jim supporters gave him a jar of Vaseline to take to prison. <laughs> you know, again, it's not illegal. Yes, it's the factory of the justice system. But it's true. It's true. I mean, you just have to look at the figures, the, the statistics of the incidence, incidence of rape in South African prisons released by the Department of Correctional Services. And you can see just how defensible this comment is. And the problem is, Mac Tosh at the time, was employed by that very justice system. He is so 
um, publicly negatively criticizing. So he was fired, not immediately, um, like many good government employees, was released, was suspended on full pay for a number of months, and then he was um, eventually fired. But <coughs> I also just included his bio there just to show you that there is no, it just says spokesperson based on the French student hunter, doesn't say I'm the spokesperson for the Hawks, but you know, Macintosh for that. Okay, then quickly on the confidentiality stuff, I've literally got two slides left. Um, if you ever start working for uh, particularly a listed company, but actually all listed companies, bear in mind the sheer extent of confidential information that you will be exposed to. And I think this is something we have to learn. Before it was so innate that there were things that were so private. But now, that sometimes doesn't come naturally to people. Anything to do with financial information, any com personal, com I mean, confidential company information, be very careful about what you're putting online. It can be as simple as going onto Facebook and saying, woohoo, we've made our budget, we're all getting bonuses. It's a confidentiality breach. If you work for a listed company, it can even be um, inside the trading and the new financial markets which came into force last year. So this is an example of just how serious that impact on the financial concerns of a company can be. This is Reed Hastings, who's, who's the CEO of Netflix. He put on his personal Facebook status, congrats to Ted Sarandos and his amazing content licensing team. Netflix monthly viewing exceeded 1 billion hours for the first time ever in June. That post was at 11 a.m. By close of business the next day, the share price had risen from $70 to nearly $82. It's a pretty serious jump because of one Facebook status. And then this is a guy who got fired. He, he tweeted <coughs> board meeting, good numbers, happy board. And then closer to home, this guy tweeted some. He was sitting in a tank and he was a presenter at Supersport and he was in a sort of a, very much a sort of seminar like this. And he was tweeting what was being released at the seminar. Because that's what people do. You know, people are sitting here tweeting, I've got no doubt. Um, but luckily, I'm not talking about anything confidential. Um, Super Sport presentation, 200,000 HD customers, compact driving over all subs, now over 5 million customers. Very confidential company information that hadn't yet been released publicly through the correct channels. So there are loads of things that I haven't spoken about. But I think I've given you a sort of an overview of the kinds of issues that we're dealing with. But this is how I finish every presentation, and that is with a picture of the billboard, because I refer to what I call the billboard test, which I think is a pretty good test before you <coughs> upload anything, to say to yourself, would I be prepared to have a massive photograph of my face on this billboard? Alongside my name, and the company I work for, the university I go to, the school I go to. And whatever it is I'm about to put online, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube or Pinterest or Vine, or a blog, or a comment underneath an article, um, or on a WhatsApp group, or a BBM group. <coughs> and if I wouldn't be prepared to have it on the scoreboard, then I wouldn't put it online. Because the legal consequences are exactly the same. The disciplinary consequences are exactly the same. And for me, again, much more important than any of that is the reputation of harm that you do yourself when you start putting this kind of content into the public domain. So those are my contact details. I have a sad plan, I have a Facebook page in the side of social media law, um, and I'm happy for you to get into touch via either of those channels, but I'm also happy to take questions now after I've had some water, because my throat's a little bit full. Um, are there any questions?